Next, we will hear from Dr. Brett Girard, a distinguished visiting executive at Levitt Partners, former Assistant Secretary for Health, member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force and Admiral U.S. Public Health Service. We're so honored to have him with us today to share the important work of the COVID-19 Patient Recovery Alliance. Well, thank you very much. It is an honor to be here with all of you. Um, I, uh, of course, left the administration uh, when the administration changed, but one of my interests was, of course, not only on the acute uh, COVID and ending the pandemic, but the consequences long-term of COVID. Um, let me clarify one thing. Although you've seen the numbers of 43, 47 million people having COVID in the US, let me correct that because those are the numbers reported to the CDC. The actual estimated numbers of patients who have uh, been infected uh, and survived COVID in the United States is more like 140 million people. Uh, there is a tremendous underestimate of reporting that's supported by serological assays. So if you look at the estimates that 30 to 50 percent of people have some uh, issues with long COVID, you're talking in the range of 30, 40, 70 million people in the United States that have persistent symptoms greater than 28 days. So while the NIH performs the absolute gold standard studies that you just heard, we have to realize that there are tens of millions of people right now who need help. Um, and we need to organize that, uh, albeit with uh, in, insufficient and inexact knowledge, in order to provide care and prepare the healthcare system. So why are we concerned about it? I would say basically five reasons. Number one is the effect on patients. Uh, I'm a pediatric ICU physician. Uh, I've taken care of patients my entire life, and we should all be patient-centric in our concern. Secondly, there are tremendous issues on return to work and disability. Uh, we see right now that uh, there is a tremendous need for uh, individuals to re-enter the workforce. Third, uh, health disparities are, are a main concern of ours. We know that uh, uh, COVID has disproportionately affected uh, people who are African American, Hispanics, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and the, and the disparities that they have in COVID are bound to be amplified in long COVID. Fourth is healthcare costs and utilization. We will have tens of millions of people who will be entering the system. And fifth, the healthcare sector impacts. How do we organize the healthcare sector? Do we have long COVID clinics? Do we have telehealth triage? How do we care for this 30 to 50% of 140 million people who have uh, uh, potentially long COVID? Next slide. So to work on these issues, um, Levitt Partners is a nonpartisan uh, health uh, policy consulting firm. Um, one of the major activities is to build alliances that are absolutely multi-sector um, in nature to attack problems and to define policies that need to be implemented uh, both on the near term, the midterm, and uh, the long term. Uh, so we at Levitt uh, started a Patient Recovery Alliance. It was started uh, before I joined them uh, in the fall of 2020 um, with the mission of supporting uh, the multi-sector, both government and private sector leaders, as we prepare to care for people with long COVID. Um, of course, we're looking at gaps, but we're also looking at opportunities, um, not just on an academic uh, kind of basis, but what really needs to be done uh, and how to do it and how to inform Congress and the administration on how to get that done over the various time periods. Next slide. Um, we uh, have many alliance partners uh, and what we try to do in our alliances is not necessarily to have every group represented, but have all the major sectors represented in a relatively small, uh, agile, but very effective group that works intensely. So what you see on the right side is there are patient advocacy groups like Survivor Corps, there are providers like uh, uh, University Hospitals, the Mind Sinai Health System, Johns Hopkins. Um, there are data aggregators like uh, Arcadia, which I will talk about. Um, there are also payers um, and there are also uh, 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 providers and nonprofit organizations. We delivered an interim report in uh, 2021, and I think the website for that will be on the next slide. Um, and it was to provide a background on solutions and interim recommendations. 
which we did present to the White House and to multiple stakeholders in Congress. Next slide. Um, the recommendations were organized in really two domains of focus, uh, models of care and payment systems. Next slide. Um, you see the website uh, at the bottom, COVID19PatientRecovery.org, that will give it to you. So the objectives of the models of care are as listed to inform the development of care models um, and to identify very specific federal policies. And then second, payment systems. Um, how do we develop payment strategies and policies to ensure that individuals with long COVID receive adequate care? And I'm not going to go through all the recommendations, but I will go through a few of them uh, on the next slide. Um, so the models of care, uh, these are individual uh, areas, but I'll just describe them in general because we really don't have time to look at all of them. First of all, ensuring optimal care for the underserved. This is very important to provide. If you have 40, 50, 60, 70 million people, you're not going to be able to do this through long COVID centers and specialty hospitals. You're going to need to get this into the community. And we know the community, uh, particularly the underserved community, uh, gets much of their care from FQHCs or community health centers. So part of the policy is to provide funding for FQHCs or community health centers in order to provide the holistic care and screening that are needed. The same thing for primary care practices. Um, we also promoted technical assistance programs, much like we did for opioids at a state-by-state -state basis, that people don't know how to take care of patients with long COVID. And it's very important that there's a loop between what is learned by the NIH and other groups back down to primary care with a holistic technical assistance program. Community grants for screening, very important. Uh, people don't know about long COVID. I have met so many people or have been in contact with people, including uh, very educated people with very high paying jobs who said, my, you know, after I had COVID, I started having these severe headaches that have been debilitating migraines uh, two or three times a week. They never even thought they could potentially have long COVID. So we need community awareness so that people who are experiencing these vague signs of fatigue or depression or sleeplessness can actually be channeled into the system. Um, on the second point, we really need to understand how people are covered uh, by their long COVID. Uh, what is the distribution of patients, not just who has long COVID, but are they covered by Medicaid? Are they covered by Medicare? Are they private? Do they fall on the gaps? And if they fall on the gaps, how do we fill those gaps? And then ongoing research and education is, of course, very important. Um, now, in addition to the NIH type of research, we also wanted to create uh, an interagency task force um, and public awareness campaigns um, that would, again, uh, promote awareness uh, and uh, uh, the ability for people to uh, receive their care. Next slide. Um, Nancy Ann DeParle, who was uh, President Obama's Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy and also ran CMS, uh, ran the payment uh, priority uh, work group that really uh, looked at a number of uh, very uh, specific issues that should be considered. Um, one of them, which would be very interesting, is to create uh, uh, is to uh, allow for uh, long COVID patients to be seen uh, in CSNPs, the Medicare Chronic Condition Specialty Needs Plans, to include them in that, to provide the ability through Medicaid that they could have, uh, med uh, they could have uh, Medicaid health homes uh, through legislation that would focus as the director of care, and a number of other uh, uh, different recommendations, including uh, a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Long COVID Demonstration Project. Since we don't know how to care for patients well, let's try some projects based on current knowledge and awareness. Um, let me say that with Cures 2.0 that came out yesterday, um, uh, after we had briefed uh, the committee uh, multiple times, that five of our policies were directly uh, put into the Cures 2.2, 2.0 legislation. Um, that includes the sources of coverage survey. That includes a learning collaborative that uh, the secretary would bring together to bring together health systems patient groups right now. So while the NIH is providing the definitive gold standard study, we could have a national learning collaborative um, to promote research in pediatric populations, which we know the NIH is doing, uh, which is a, a fantastic 
um, to direct the National Academies to conduct a study to evaluate the presence and causes of disparities in long COVID, and finally to have national education and awareness campaigns. So these are just some examples of how we put uh, the policy ideas into practice, and we're so pleased that five of these policies directly briefed made it to the Cures 2.0 legislation, and we look forward to working with the White House and Congress on evaluating and potentially implementing more of these policies. Next slide. For the last couple of minutes, I, I want to be a little bit provocative, and that is to talk about the role of COVID-19 vaccination in the prevention or treatment of long COVID, and is, and is there a role? Because I think there are sources of evidence that we can get, albeit not randomized controlled trials, but that are hypothesis generating that may really give us a hint at the role of what is causing long COVID. Um, first of all, let me say that vaccination will prevent COVID. And the best way to prevent getting long COVID is to, pre is to prevent getting COVID in the first place. So getting your vaccines, two vaccines, and for most people, and I would suggest the FDA will probably approve the third jab for all, um, getting your full courses of immunization is your best way to prevent long COVID. Now, let's look at the next slide. There's a second uh, mechanism, and this was pointed out by a study in over 1.2 million people in the, in the United Kingdom. And um, if you look down at the graphs, I'll have you look at this left side, the symptoms lasting uh, less than, uh, greater than 28 days. This is really long COVID. Um, and it goes to younger adults and older adults. And what you're seeing is if you've had two doses of COVID vaccine, even if you get COVID after the vaccine, your chances of getting long COVID are significantly reduced. So this is the second mechanism. Number one, vaccines prevent you from getting COVID. But secondly, even if you get COVID after vaccines, uh, your long COVID chances go down significantly. Now it says here, which is very interesting, is that if you only get one vaccine, it's not so good. But if you get the full course of two, we don't have data on three you could actually prevent long COVID. Now, why might this be the case? Uh, one of the leading hypotheses is that there's persistent anagenemia that has chronic inflammation. We know that you can be positive in your nose for many weeks or even months after a COVID infection. And there are anecdotal data that shows that the viral uh, nuclear uh, material, the RNA, can be present in the gut in many other places for many, many months. So it might make sense that a vaccine could help uh, mount a sterilizing immune response uh, so it can prevent long COVID by getting rid of all that anagenemia. Now that's a hypothesis, but it's an important one. Most recently, the next slide, which was just published last week and it's not peer reviewed. Um, the next slide, please. This looked at a French cohort, again, of hundreds of thousands of patients, but they did a case control study of all people with long COVID uh, of people who got vaccinated during the course of long COVID. And what you see on the right side here are the recovery curves. This is the rate of complete remission of their long COVID. And these are vaccines at least three months after the start of, uh, long, of being infected with COVID. So this is long in advance in the future. What you see here is even three months after COVID, if you get vaccinated, the rate of remission of long COVID was double if you were vaccinated. So in addition to being a preventative, this study suggests possibly, it's not randomized control, it's not peer reviewed yet, but that a vaccine, even if you have long COVID, could be therapeutic. And this matches some empirical data by patients. Finally, the last slide is that um, in addition to these studies, um, as part of the Long COVID Alliance, if I can have the next slide, please. Arcadia, um, which is um, a member of the Alliance and is an aggregator of de-identified clinical uh, uh, data, is doing a study looking at over 150 million patient records that are amalgamated from health systems, from practice management systems, from claims data, eligibility data. And what they are looking at right now is one year's worth of COVID activity in the United States, predominantly before Delta because it takes time to evaluate these patients. And what they're looking for and looking at, and will publish within the next week, is a retrospective analysis looking at 
whether COVID vaccination after the onset of COVID uh, can actually prevent in this very large database the development of long COVID. And if it can help prevent, are there any time windows? Um, you know, I can't uh, scoop the publication, but their data are highly provocative and uh, will be uh, in every media as soon as it's out within the next week. So that's it. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I think we have to go hand in hand here. This is a time where science needs to drive the policy. And that's what we've done from the policy side. But as they say, be evidence-based, but if you don't have evidence, make some. Um, we're trying to make some here by looking at the sources we have, uh, again, while we anticipate greatly the tremendous gold standard research being done by the NIH as outlined to you in the previous presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jawa, for your leadership, both during the pandemic response and also helping to lead these efforts to collect data and develop new models of care for patients living with long COVID. Um, we